Hello, everyone. The term tradition is not an easy one to get one's mind around, mainly because it is used to connote several different things. Yet, understanding tradition and its role in the transmission and interpretation of divine revelation is very important, especially as we dialogue with Christians who have what we might call a Bible-only approach to what God has revealed to us. These are fellow Christians who do not accept the role of sacred tradition in the transmission and interpretation of divinely revealed truth. Now, when it comes to the truths of divine revelation, they only look to the Bible. In contrast, for Catholics, sacred tradition and sacred scripture are two sides of the one coin. For Catholics, sacred scripture is actually a product of the church's tradition. The word tradition literally means what is handed on. Tradition refers to the process by which the message of Christ is transmitted from one generation to another. Now, in the early days of Christianity, the transmission of God's word occurred through the oral preaching of the apostles, through the communal and worship life of the first Christians, and through anything that contributed to the sanctification of the people. That's to be found in Divine Revelation Vatican II's document. In the early decades of Christianity, the Word of God, that Divine Revelation, was not transmitted in written form because the books of the New Testament were not yet written. And after they were written, they were not available to all the Christian communities and they were not intended to contain all that Jesus said and did. Now John ends his gospel with these words. There are many other things that Jesus did, but if they were to be described individually, I do not think that the whole world could contain the books that would be written. John 21, 25. Now when the books of the New Testament were written, they became an invaluable and infallible source of divine revelation. But divine revelation also continued to be passed on orally and in the communal and worship life of the church. In his second letter to the Thessalonians, Paul writes, Hold the teachings that you have learned, whether by word or letter of ours. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 now, when the term tradition is used in the context of the early decades of Christianity, it is referred to as apostolic tradition because of its closeness to the time of the apostles. In time, sacred tradition came to include the writings of the early church fathers. These writings are very important for a true and authentic understanding of God's word, both oral and written, because these men lived and wrote in the generation after the apostles. They were the recipients of what we call above the apostolic tradition. They wrote and interpreted it for the people of their time. We can safely say that any interpretation of God's word that ignores the writing of the early church fathers is on very shaky ground indeed. These days, what is leading, what is leading a significant number of Protestant ministers to journey home to the Catholic Church is their study of the early church fathers. Creedal statements of faith by early church councils also became a part of sacred tradition. As aspects of Christian belief were erroneously or falsely interpreted, the church formulated creedal statements of faith like the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. Such creedal statements helped the faithful to steer clear of false teachings and profess what was true doctrine. Now, the Catholic understanding of tradition not only refers to a set of Christians' beliefs received from the past, it also refers to how the Church throughout the centuries has, through prayer and study, grown in her understanding of what is passed on and handed down from one generation to another. This growth is understanding, in understanding is always a growth from partial to fuller vision, so what was believed continues to be believed 
though its depths and consequences are more fully realised. For our global church family, Vatican Council II and the years following it was a wonderful experience of growth in understanding sacred scripture. At the same council, the bishops aided by brilliant and dedicated theologians and of course the Holy Spirit came to a deeper understanding of every aspect of the church's life. This growth in understanding led to a host of new practices such as a greater involvement of the lay faithful in the liturgy and the life of the church. We started to relate and to pray with other Christian churches and even with non-Christian religions. Our attitude towards the world was more open and less defensive. Now another aspect of sacred tradition is that Catholic beliefs that are only found in seed form in scripture later blossomed as the church continued to meditate on scripture. Now examples of this are beliefs about Mary and purgatory. Having stated that some beliefs in our church only fully developed over the centuries, it is very important to note that for Catholics, nothing in tradition can be contrary to what is contained in the Bible. In fact, the church must often examine our beliefs and practices in the light of sacred scripture. Having said that, it's also important to note that for Catholics, a belief or practice is only considered non-scriptural if it contradicts or is not in harmony with scripture. For example, the pastoral practice of baptizing infants is not explicitly stated in the Bible, but neither is it forbidden. It is implied in Acts, which speaks of whole households being baptized. Acts 16.33 Now, as we use the term tradition, it is important that we distinguish it from human traditions, sometimes called tradition with a small t. The latter refers to man-made rules, customs and practices that are connected to certain teachings of the church but are not in themselves core teachings. For example, the Catholic belief in the real presence of Jesus in the bread and wine at Mass is a core church teaching that cannot be changed. But how we celebrate the Mass belongs to human tradition. It can change from generation to generation. The Mass can be said, for instance, in Latin or in the language of the people. People can receive Holy Communion in their hand or on their tongue. The Sacrament of Holy Orders, however, belongs to tradition with a large T. The Church has no authority to state that it will no longer have this sacrament, for instance. But the practice of mandatory celibacy for all seeking ordination, that's a human tradition or belongs to tradition with a small t. The church could and has ordained married men. When Jesus condemned traditions in the Bible, Matthew 23, he was condemning human traditions that were an obstacle rather than a help to people in their relationship with God. Now, when it comes to the transmission and interpretation of divine revelation, the role of the church is to be the protector and interpreter of God's word. We can say that the church's role is twofold. To protect the deposit of faith from false and erroneous interpretations, Acts 20, 28 32, and to draw forth a deeper understanding of the spiritual treasures found in divine revelation. When it comes to the church protecting the deposit of faith from false interpretations and discovering its rich treasure, the lay faithful, theologians and the church's magisterium each has a valuable role to play. In the 5th century in Constantinople, the heretical Bishop Nestorius started to preach that Mary was not Theotokos, the Greek word for mother of God, but only the mother of the human Jesus. Now the lay faithful virtually revolted against their bishop's heretical teaching, and when the Council of Ephesus condemned Nestorius and declared Mary the mother of God, 
believers took to the streets enthusiastically chanting, Tio Takos, Tio Takos. Every era of the church, beginning with the early church fathers, have been blessed with holy and brilliant theologians who have helped the whole church come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of Catholic beliefs. The wonderful fruits of the Vatican Council, Vatican Council II, were largely due to dedicated theologians who, in the decades previous to the Council, were germinating many of the wonderful insights that eventually filled the documents of the Council. Catholics believe that the Holy Spirit enabled the bishops in union with the Pope to recognise God's revelation. The magisterium is a living source of discernment for our church family. When it comes to the protection and interpretation of divine revelation and the life of the church, the role of the magisterium, that is, the bishop's teaching in union with the Pope, is that of a watchdog of orthodoxy, which means right belief. Down through the ages, great theological battles have taken place concerning church beliefs and practices. Sooner or later, it is the role of the magisterium to step in and proclaim what theological opinions, pastoral practices or devotions are faithful or unfaithful to sacred tradition. Hence, the saying, Roma locuta est, causa finita est, or... Rome has spoken. The case is closed. Now, a recent example of this is the issue of the ordination of women to the priesthood. After much debate, the late St. John Paul II firmly stated that the Church had no authority to ordain women to the priesthood. Since the beginning of Protestantism in the 16th century, Christianity has been divided into hundreds of new churches, usually concerning the interpretation of Scripture. And one of the inherent strengths of Catholicism is the ministry of the Pope who works with the magisterium to protect the unity of our faith. Having a Bible without the magisterium is like having a constitution without the Supreme Court or having a school without a headmaster. Thank you all very much for listening, and God bless you all. Oh.